anniversary of the founding of the Michigan Theater Foundation, originally called the Michigan Community Theater Foundation. And I want to take just a few minutes to talk with you about some of the events that led to saving this theater. And on stage, in a little while, we will see some of the key players uh, who were there in the 70s who helped us to save this theater. There are many unsung heroes in this task. This is something that cannot be accomplished by one person only. And I want to, to, uh, to introduce two people to you, three people actually. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce to you David and Joe Lau. Dave, where are you? They're out there somewhere. Stand up, Dave, and there's Joe. David Lau was the first person I met in Ann Arbor in 1970. He had a key to the Michigan Theater, and he was down here working on the organ. So Dave had been involved with this project, I think, longer than just about anybody else here. Another person I'd like to introduce, who's here with his lovely spouse, Beth, is Newton Bates, or Bud Bates. Bud, stand up, please. He was one of our organists for 40 years, and he said to me this afternoon, well, I didn't do anything to help with the Michigan Theater Foundation. I said, yeah, but we all talked to you, and you kept us sane, and he did indeed that. So I think it's uh, not stretching the truth too much to say that this theater was saved because of this instrument down here. And you might say, oh no, that can't possibly be the case. Well, it was the case for the uh, uh, Fox Theater in Atlanta. It was the case for the Tennessee Theater in Knoxville. It was the case for the Alabama Theater in Birmingham and lots of other theaters around the country. And you say, why is that? It's because these are unique and irreplaceable instruments which were designed for a specific purpose they were intended to be used to accompany silent films in movie palaces like this. The first theater pipe organs went in in 1912. The last one went into Radio City Music Hall in 1932. It is still there, by the way, being played every day before the Christmas show. That's the largest theater organ in the world. Most movie theaters of this size had smaller instruments like this lovely little instrument down here. And there were about 7,000 of them made over a period of uh, 20 years or so. About half of those instruments were made by the Rudolph Wurlitzer Company out of North Tonawanda, New York. So the term the mighty Wurlitzer does not refer to a jukebox, it refers to the theater pipe organs. There were many other manufacturers, including some church organ companies like the A.P. Moeller Company that made uh, theater organs as well. This particular instrument was made by the Barton Company out of Oshkosh, Wisconsin. They made instruments which were distributed regionally throughout the Midwest. The rule was that if you couldn't get a technician out in 20, within 24 hours by train to service the organ, you didn't go any further than that. So there are lots of Bartons in Michigan and Illinois and Iowa and places near the plant, the factory in Wisconsin. Theater organs work exactly like church organs, but they don't sound the same, as you well know if you've heard them. Theater organs are designed to sound as orchestral as possible. They are designed to imitate the sounds of an orchestra. And they do that by using a wide variety of stops that have uh, orchestral names like oboe and trumpet and strings and so on. They also employ a heavy tremulant or vibrato. There's actually a slight difference between the two. And that's to mimic the way a violinist plays. So when you hear an orchestra, you hear a lot of vibrato coming from the violins, and it gives a, a soft sound to the instrument. And that's, that's what theater organs do. And they also have other effects on them, such as bells and whistles and horns and uh, tuned percussions and untuned percussions, uh, which can be used to accompany the films. What happened to theater organs is what happened to steam locomotives. The technology changed, and by the late 1920s, even the big movie palaces were switching over to talking films. First the Vitaphone system, and then the movie tone system. 
the Michigan theaters switched to sound in June of 1929. So these theaters that were built in the late 20s were in fact white elephants, as it were, by the time they opened. So most of the theaters stopped using their orchestras, stopped using their organs, and the instruments sat here and deteriorated over a period of years. In the mid-1950s, many movie palaces went down because uh, not only had the urban landscape changed, people were be beginning to move to the suburbs, also television had come along, and so attendance had dropped in the movie theaters by about 50% in the early 50s. Well, the solution to the problem, of course, is to close the big old theater. And a lot of the theaters started going down, and individuals became concerned about what was going to happen to the remaining theater organs. So in 1955, an organization called the American Theater Organ Society was formed, and its purpose through local chapters and regional chapters was to save as many of the theater organs as possible. Hopefully those instruments could stay in the theater. Many of them did not. They went out to restaurants or homes as the big houses went down. The Michigan Theater was a unique situation. The Michigan Theater had an organist until 1950. His name was Paul Tompkins, and Paul played um, overtures. Uh, he would play a you know, song slide presentation or a solo number. And of course, before that, there were silent films that were accompanied. We also had a, a manager who was a, a deeply committed professional. His name was Jerry Hogue. And Jerry loved the instrument, and he protected it. So there was some use of the organ periodically in the 1950s. We understand that even um, some students from the, uh, the School of Music came down and uh, uh, practiced on it. We have a few, a few incidental uh, records that indicate that it was used periodically. <clears throat> Dave, uh, tell me when you came in here, 68 or so? About 1968. So there was an effort in the, in the late 60s to get the organ going again. Um, there had been some water damage and it had been fixed. So the instrument did play, but not real well. So in the early 70s, a group of us got together and made a concerted effort to get the instrument in, in good enough shape so that it could be used regularly. So a group of volunteers came down in the early 70s. We met every Sunday morning. We skipped church, unfortunately, and came down and worked on the organ. And after about a year or so, the instrument was in pretty good condition so that it could be played. In September of 1972, we had a concert with Lynn Larson. Lynn Larson brought the organ up playing Hail to the Victors, and it had not been played, heard in public for decades. Uh, in December of 1972, we made the decision, which was very unusual, and that was to have the organ played regularly every weekend. Rupert Otto, Newton Bates, and I began to play the instrument before uh, audiences, and we've been doing it ever since. And so this is one of the few instruments in the country which is actually heard on a regular basis. Like it or not, that tradition of hearing the organ on a regular basis for about eight years was what, prompt, what led to the efforts to save the theater. And we will talk about that more uh, on stage in a few minutes. The Theater Organ Club got word that the theater was going to be closed and converted into a food court uh, in the spring of 1978. That was at least nine months before there was any public announcement about the future of the Michigan Theater. We were at a picnic when the, uh, the, for the Theater Organ Club people, we, had a, we were having a picnic and the announcement was made and the question was, what do we do about it? So a bunch of us got on the phone and started calling uh, Dave and myself and several other people began calling. It took us eight or nine months, but we finally got the attention of people who knew how to help us save the theater. So the initial effort to save the theater came out of the theater organ club group who were here. They did not want this instrument to go to somebody's living room. It was intended for a movie theater, 
it was worth preserving. Once these, one of these things goes, you're not going to get another one. They're very, very rare and irreplaceable. So that was the uh, initial impetus to save the theater. But secondly, we also had keys to the theater. We knew how things worked. And we had a group of volunteers who were willing to come and actually operate the theater during its first months and first year, actually. So we were in the building and doing work here, and that is paramount when you're trying to save an old movie theater. So one of the interesting things about this instrument is that it has been completely restored. And in just a minute, Andy Rogers is going to come and, sorry, and play for us. And Andy is going to play something very unusual, which we've been looking forward to hearing for about 30 years. The old movie palaces often had an exit march, which was written for the organist to play as the last crowd left at the end of the day. Dick Liebert, who was the senior organist at Radio City, wrote Radio City March, which I think he only played there once, but there, is, you know, there are recordings of it. There was Hello, Hello, the RKO, which was used in Rochester, New York, and a lot of these theaters had an exit march written for them. When the Michigan Theater was restored, the first restoration, 1986-87, I decided in my stupidity that it, we should have an exit march. We should have a Michigan Theater march. So I approached Art Stefan. Anybody remember Art? He played the piano at Weber's. He was, ran the Ann Arbor Silent Film Society, you remember, right? A wonderful guy. And I said, Art, could you write me a Michigan Theater march? And he said, sure. So I paid him $100. He delivered the manuscript, and it sat in Russ Collins' office for about 30 years. <laughs> and finally, Andy Rogers, uh, our chief organist, discovered it and said, I think we should start playing this. So when Andy comes to play for you for about 15 minutes, uh, the last thing he's going to play will be the premier performance of Art Stephens' Michigan Theater March. And so, insignificant as it may appear, we will be the only movie theater in the country that has its own exit march, and we're going to play it as often as we possibly can. It takes about 30 seconds for the console to go down, and so I figured that's what we'll do is, you know, we'll hit the down button and start playing it. Uh, Russ wanted me to uh, take about five minutes to do a, a answer any questions that you might have about the instrument or the initial, the impetus to, to uh, move to save the theater. And we have just a couple of minutes to do that. Anybody have a question? No questions? I'm sorry? Oh, the question is, has the console always been gold? Yes, it is. Uh, fortunately, nobody got in there and repainted it. Uh, it is called a circus wagon console because the Barton Organ Company made circus wagons, and then they started making the little carousel organs, you know, that are, that are belt-driven and the, and the carousels, and that morphed into theater pipe organs. Yeah, good question. And that was redone locally uh, when we took the console out. Uh, all, it was, all the cosmetic work was done locally by, by a furniture rebuilder. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, what? What portion is actually the original? For, for this one? Oh, the question is, is uh, what portion of the organ is original? Uh, all of it is original. It, it's just been taken apart and completely redone, but it's all original, except for the innards of the console. The inside of the console is now a computer, and it will allow the organ to play itself so you can record yourself. But we had to get rid of the electro-pneumatic relay. It was very unreliable. Uh, it was in a room back over here. Well, that's the only thing that's been changed. We have a, we have a new blower, which is uh, twice the horsepower of the, uh, of the old one. But everything else is the same. And it will sound essentially the same. It just is clean and perfect, and everything works. And if you want to go have lunch on the chamber, in the chamber, you can. It's so clean. Um, anything else? Yeah. Uh, this is a good question. Um, 
uh, what is what is the, the size of this instrument? Is it large, small, wh whatever? Um, this is not the largest Barton made. The largest one was built for the stadium in Chicago. I would say this is an average size theater organ, uh, 13 ranks. Uh, Radio City is 58 ranks. Um, the organ up at Hill Auditorium is 144, which tells you church organs are a lot bigger. Theater organs are small, but they're loud. Uh, and the reason they're small is because we don't have room in here for, for a big instrument. So theater organs tend to be relatively small, but very loud, especially when you're upstairs trying to fix one. Um, let me introduce uh, Andy Rogers to you. Uh, Andy is going to play for us for about, oh, 10 or 15 minutes. And Andy has been our senior organist for what, 10 years now? Uh, yeah, 11, he says. There are five folks who play. Uh, Andy plays most of the time. I play some. Steve Warner plays. David Hufford plays. Uh, and Lance Luce. So we have a, a nice staff of people. By the way, the people who restored this instrument was the Renaissance Pipe Organ Company in Ann Arbor. They had never done a theater organ before, and they said, I don't know, maybe not a theater organ, but they volunteered to do it, and they have been absolutely wonderful. They are total perfectionists, and it's really been worth the effort. And I thank the foundation and Russ and Jamie and everybody else for supporting this project. It's been, and Hillary, thank you, Hillary, uh, for, for saying yes, let's go ahead and do it. So Andy, come and play.
Michigan Theater, 40th anniversary. Yes, indeed. Good evening and welcome to this special, well, this portion of the program, a special evening here for the Michigan Theater celebrating its 40th anniversary as a nonprofit organization. Uh, I feel like I'm speaking to friends and family. Thank you all for everything you do uh, to make uh, what happens here at the Michigan Theater possible and the Michigan Theater itself to be here. So really, thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause for all of that. My name is Michael Jewett. I work for 89.1 WEMU, the public radio affiliate at Eastern Michigan University. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have been partnering with the Michigan Theater for, for decades now. Uh, uh, their 40th anniversary uh, as being a nonprofit roughly coincides with our 40th uh, anniversary of being a uh, jazz radio format radio station, which is rare in the country. Uh, so we want to thank the Michigan for being there for us as well. You know, it's almost like a foregone conclusion. We're sitting here in this beautiful movie palace, theatrical palace, and you know, it's a done deal. We know for sure that this is the way the Michigan theater is supposed to be, but lo those many years ago, that wasn't really uh, the case back in 1979. This, people were planning maybe this would be a nice food court. Yeah, because nothing screams the unique experience of being in Ann Arbor around campus, uptown, downtown, everyone is saying it, of going to a food court kind of a generic experience. I think what, being a little bit of a geography nut here, I think what makes a place special are the various spaces within that place that really give it character, that give it an identity. And I think one of the key things about Ann Arbor is, well, we're sitting in it. It's in the Michigan Theater. Uh, I'm a lifelong Ann Arborite. I have a cherished memory of my first experience going to a movie without adult supervision with just me and my friends was at the Michigan Theater to see Yellow Submarine. <laughs> and you know, when you're nine, everything is huge. You know, so I know the theater hasn't expanded, but it just seemed like the most incredible, incredible place to see, you know, the Fab Four and the Blue Meanies. And yeah, I'm assuming everyone has seen Yellow Submarine, so yeah. So that was the, the first movie I saw at the Michigan. The last movie was just a couple of days ago, uh, Miles Davis, Birth of the Cool, which was good, yeah. A couple of good bookends there for, uh, for theatrical experiences. So, uh, you know, it's a special place, uh, uh, the Michigan Theater, so thank you all for making it possible. And we're going to thank some uh, of the uh, key people that made it all possible tonight. So we move on. Uh, we'll introduce, I think you already know, Dr. Henry Aldridge to my... To my right, uh, emeritus professor at Eastern Michigan University, uh, film, television, and radio. I uh, became deeply involved with the restoration of the theater's Barton organ in the early 70s. Uh, Henry and other passionate organ volunteers begged the city to save the theater from becoming that food court, the dreaded food court. He was and continues to be a highly effective uh, advocate of both the theater and the organ itself. Uh, the mayor of Ann Arbor, the Honorable Lou, uh, Lou Belcher, is with us this evening. He heard the community's cry to save the Michigan Theater and work with other community leaders and city council to save it. He has a number of interesting and compelling stories about how it came to be uh, that the Michigan Theater was saved. Uh, the Towsley family of Ann Arbor, of course, has had a huge impact uh, you know, throughout the city. Uh, a key community leader contacted by Mayor Belcher was Margaret Towsley. She was a visionary a philanthropist who helped the theater overcome uh, a bumpy start. Mrs. Towsley's daughter, Judy Dow Rommelhart, is with us tonight. Yeah. I'm, told, I'm told that Judy danced on this very stage as a young girl. We'd like to hear that story. More importantly, perhaps, uh, led transformative fundraising campaigns and produced stellar theatrical shows that developed the theater into the community center it has become. Uh, also with us is the current uh, chair of the Board of the Michigan Theater Foundation, Jamie Buer. Uh, his volunteer leadership, yes, his volunteer leadership of the board uh, has been outstanding on so many different levels. Uh, like myself, a native Ann Arborite, who has also served as the chair of the Delanis Center Board, the Ann Arbor Community Foundation Board, as well as many other uh, nonprofit and corporate boards. Uh, and also, of course, we all know him 
I was joking, he's the other fern on the side of the stage here. Uh, Russ Collins, <laughs> our executive director. Uh, uh, here at the Michigan Theater Foundation for 37 years, who represents generations of employees who have dedicated uh, their professional lives to saving and nurturing this community gem. So thank you all for all you've done. Uh, a few things that we just wanted to touch on. Uh, we'll start with Henry. Uh, how did you learn about the state of the organ and the precarious state that the Michigan was in back in the late 70s? Well, it, it happened because of one of the organists and Weber's restaurant and just a coincidence. Uh, but before I tell the story, I just wanted to mention that uh, the Angelo Polis family, a local Greek family, owned the Michigan theater. They paid for its construction, but they did not operate the theater. It was operated by the W.S. Butterfield Corporation, which had a 50-year lease on the, on the theater, which was about to expire. The Butterfield Corporation didn't know what to do with the building, and the Polis family was desperately trying to figure out what they were going to do with the structure. So Rupert Otto, who was one of the organists, Rupert uh, uh, taught at Pioneer High School, and he had a student who worked as a, as a waiter at Weber's. And one evening, these folks came in and spread out on the table these, these plans for the Michigan Theater. And it was the Polis family and the architects. And they were talking about what they were going to do and turn it into a food court and so forth. So the student ran and told Rupert Otto. Rupert Otto told the assembled theater organ group at a picnic in May of 1978 and said, they're going to, they're going to do something to the Michigan Theater. What do we do with the organ? And several of us said, you can't do that. We've got to save the building. So the rest of the crowd turned to us and said, okay, so what are you going to do about it? So that's essentially uh, how, it, how it came about. But just one thing, and that is we found out about this a good nine months before there was any publicity about it. And I think had we not had that nine months, we would not have been able to, to be successful because uh, the plans would have already been made. But we got the, the jump on it. So that's how it happened. Okay. There's all these little intricate details and everything. It wasn't just a, you know, a walk in the park, as it were. Mayor Belcher, can you tell us, I'm sure when this came to your attention, everyone at City Council and City Hall just started doing cartwheels. I mean, this is the fabulous thing. Let's invest serious money and time and effort to save the, well, so how was this received when, when you were in office? I only had six Republicans, one Democrat who would vote to buy the theater, and I needed desperately one more Democrat. So I sicked the local civics teacher, Joyce Chesborough, who was the tiger of the team, and I said, I don't care how you sink the Bismarck, sink it. And she found that eighth vote we needed to buy the theater. But my first of inclination was Henry. And he led a delegation of John Hathaway and his lovely wife, Mary, who just passed away a few weeks ago, and Henry. And we met down with the old German. And they presented a pretty good case. And I'd been shopping around for what we're going to do for a civics theater in Ann Arbor. We used the University of Michigan theaters all the time, but the real problem was we couldn't schedule anything. We had to take whatever they had left. And I thought this would be a great place that we could make a, an art center. I've always said, and I did then, General Motors may have Detroit. Detroit may have General Motors. But in Ann Arbor, it's sports, the arts, movies, restaurants. And this fit right into that whole little paradigm. So I, I'll talk to you a, a few funny stories later. But the daughter, performer, 
president of the theater at one time and donor. Yes, you are. Her mother and father were the great people that they were to Ann Arbor. And she's a great woman and has given so much to this theater. Judy. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> I don't think I can pose a better question or just kind of like an open, uh, what was it like for the, the for your family and you to get involved and what, what led you to your belief in yep. making it happen here at the Michigan Theater? I was living in New York at the time and uh, married to my dear husband, Bob Alexander. And we had decided to move back to Ann Arbor and, and uh, because we, I came home to do Hello, Dolly! for Civic Theater. And, and my folks just had the best time. I think they lost 20 years of their lives while we were around. We just were out for dinner and did everything there was to do. So when we came home, Bob, Bob was not a perfect match for the Ann Arbor Summer Festival. And so all of a sudden, my mother called up and she said, Bob? You've got your first big fundraising job in Ann Arbor. And, and it was just, we just went to work. Uh, we were so excited about the Michigan Theater. And I have to tell you, I have some wonderful connections. I went to high school uh, with two wonderful people. Uh, one of them was George Finkel, whose dad is the architect of this building. And, and Betsy Polis, who was one of my best friends. So when, when we finally got around to meeting all these people, it was like old home week. <laughs> it was such fun. But so we, we immediately, anyway, once Bob had decided that we were going to stay in Ann Arbor no matter what. And, and we had the most wonderful time setting up a fundraising drive and planning things. You have, if you, any of you remember when, when that other, that other group of people ran on the theater, they had, uh, they'd really done a terrible job. They painted it, the whole inside battleship gray. And it was just horrible. <laughs> And so it, it was such fun. And, it, and my father, you and uh, talking about civic theater, it, one of the funniest stories is my father called up and he said, well, don't you think it's a perfect, perfect place for civic theater? And I said, well, it's an awful big house for, <laughs> for people to perform in. Uh, you know, and uh, I'm not sure, Dad. And he said, oh, it's got to work. It's a civic theater can, can work out in the lobby building their sets and we can have the stage and all this. And I said, Dad, that won't work. <laughs> but it, you know, it, it, it was so wonderful that my parents loved theater as much as they did. And they always made, uh, well, with exceptions of a few times, they, they were happy that I decided to be in the theater business. <laughs> and, but we, we had a wonderful time. And, and the, the redoing of this theater was unbelievable. And I said, what, eight years ago out in the lobby, I was talking and I said, you remember, everybody, this is our theater. It doesn't belong to the University of Michigan. It doesn't belong to Washington Community College. It doesn't belong to, oh, there's more theaters in Ann Arbor nowadays. It's our theater. We really, we, 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 we own it and we've worked for it and everybody sitting in this audience has given money and been a part of making it the best place to go in Ann Arbor, except for the football stadium on good night. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a wonderful place. And I don't know, I think I got off st st stories here. I'll pass this on, I'm not sure. They're all yes. yours. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, uh, Jamie, uh, uh, Ann Arbor native like myself, current board chair, uh, uh, served uh, uh, for a while here at, uh, at the Michigan Theater. Why is it important for you to fill the role that you do, and why do you think 
you know, I guess to you know further reinforce what what Judy was talking about, why why is the Michigan Theater so important in your mind to the fabric of life, the quality of life here in Ann Arbor? Well, Michael, as you mentioned, uh, I am a native, uh, and other than a little time in the Army and an undergraduate degree at Indiana University, uh, I've lived here my whole life. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you become part of the community. Uh, for 30 years, I commuted to downtown Detroit and to downtown Birmingham. That's where my employment took me. So worked hard, chased three boys, uh, and basically uh, ran the first 30 years of my life not that much involved in the community. Things changed in 2002 when, surprise, surprise, the company I was working for was bought by a bank. Uh, I didn't particularly like uh, the organization, chose not to stay, was able to parachute out of that organization, come back to Ann Arbor, obviously lived here all the time, come back to Ann Arbor, and uh, I always had wanted to be president of a company. So I started a company, made myself the president, and I continue as the president to this day and the sole employee. But more importantly, it got me back in Ann Arbor full time, uh, and that's when uh, my dear departed friend, Phil Bowen, may he rest in peace, recruited me to the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation. That was really my first stop along the way. Uh, and then, some might say I fell under the spell, but there were two fairly well-known uh, people in town uh, who took me under their wing. One, uh, the consigliere to many of the uh, charities here in town, Mr. Del Dunbar. And the beautiful lady to my left, Judy Dow Rummelhart, and they began a series of assignments for me, the first one of which was the shelter. That was 14 years ago. I'm still on the shelter board of directors. The next assignment, and uh, this is really, to me, the, the pinnacle uh, of my uh, philanthropic career serving on boards, was the Michigan Theater. I'm now in my third in four, uh, or fourth year. I'll be completing my second year as chair uh, in April of the coming year. But here's the thing that I would tell you. I don't want to be corny, but coming back to Ann Arbor, being here full time, and getting involved in uh, a number of different charities, some of which I've named, uh, really sort of changed my life. Because the first 30 years, I was too busy really to meet new people. Uh, and pretty much uh, hung out with my uh, friends that I'd gone to high school with uh, and others. But in the last ballpark 20 years, through the philanthropic activity I've been involved in, I've made, met 20 or 30 times more people and felt so much more a part of the community that it really uh, ha has been a, a wonderful change for me and made me feel so much more a part of Ann Arbor. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and now to, to the man. <laughs> and I'm really thrilled that I get to call him a friend and a cohort and whatnot. Uh, Russ, how long have you been uh, involved in your current position at the Michigan? For 37 years. 37 years. He's like, and I, I you know, I was being a good lawyer there. I knew the answer to the question already. I think you, you were you started at the Michigan like six months before I started in public radio. So it's a uh, yeah to have that. I know how special it is to uh, do something that you believe in uh, that's valued by the community. Just it's it's a, it's its own special kind of reward. Uh, but in that nearly four decades, I'm sure there's some some highlights or some proudest moments or favorite memories, a few perhaps? Absolutely, and some people say a couple of river rats can't add up to much, so I, you know, go rats. <laughs> um, uh, sitting here tonight with uh, the love coming from this audience is a really special night. Um, I hope that you have had the same kind of experiences that I've had sitting in the audience uh, literally being transported someplace else, either from a movie that you're watching or a concert that you're at. Um, I remember uh, sitting and watching the movie Greed, a silent movie, Greed, with a grand piano in the orchestra pit and Bill Balcom improvising the score to that based on his opera, which was based on the same story. Um, I remember sitting in the screening room 
and, and watching uh, a movie called The Station Agent and, and going, if I ever direct a movie, this is the movie I want to direct. I was totally swept away by that film. Um, uh, sitting up at the top of the balcony um, and listening to the symphony is a, is a really wonderful experience. We've had touring Broadway shows, we've had contemporary performance events. Uh, Sankai Juku, U of M, um, University Musical Society is doing in just a little bit, uh, did their first performances here. Um, uh, we, I had taken my son to New York um, when he was uh, eight years old, I think, and we'd gone to the uh, Radio City Music Christmas show. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and that same year, we'd done the Sankai Juku, which is a bunch of naked Japanese people doing dance. And I had a videotape of it back when there was videotape, and he saw it, and he really wanted to go to it, and I tried desperately to talk him out of it. Um, and, uh, but we sat right in the first, or in, the, in the corner over there of the balcony, and he watched the whole thing completely wrapped. A year later, there was, an ad, there was a news piece about the Radio City Music Hall um, Christmas show about to open, and I said, do you remember going there? Do you remember seeing that show? Couldn't remember at all, but he could tell you every detail about that Sankai Juku performance. <laughs> and, you know, the power of art is remarkable. Um, in 2006, uh, the Michigan Theater received this award here, which we called Hattie. It's the League of Historic American Theaters, L Hat, called it Hattie, uh, for being the outstanding historic theater in North America for this restoration that these folks uh, made happen. Um, and then last summer, I got the other one, uh, actually, we call this one Ellie and this one Hattie, who cares? Uh, but the, I, I, got, I got that award for, uh, um, for outstanding individual contribution in uh, historic theater restoration. <laughs> and, and that award would not have been possible without this community. Uh, and if I'm going to reduce the community to one person in my life, that one person is going to be Deb Pollock, my wife. She and I met when working here, and she and Jill McDonough uh, and myself, and I think Jill, Jill was here earlier, if she's not here now. Yeah. Hi, Jill. Um, made quite a team, and the fourth member of that team was Scott Clark. So Scott Clark worked at the Michigan Theater for 38 years. He, had me, he has me beat by a year, but he just retired. Um, and uh, we are so grateful for Scott Clark's work over his 38 years at the Michigan Theater. He knows this building better than anybody. Uh, we still have his telephone number, so we're going to call him. Um, he actually was on a stage call all day today and was supposed to be here but couldn't be here. But let's give Scott a big round of applause. <laughs> But back to Deb, without her support every day and her support over these many decades, I could not um, have pursued this opportunity uh, and, and done the work that this community uh, demanded. Um, Jill McDonough, when she was working here many years ago, she left many years ago and worked for the university for over 20 years, but when she was working, um, we, we were, I was worried about something or other and whether we were going to succeed, you know, just a small matter like that. And she said, look, this project is something that the community wants. And it's like a train on a track. And the only thing we have to do as the staff of the theater is not screw it up. And I think that that is absolutely true. You, the community, tell us what to do. These historic walls tell us what to do. And all we do is listen and do the best we can to move things forward. You can't do a project like this without excellent volunteer leadership represented by Jamie Bure, and he is an outstanding, outstanding board chair. Thank you, thank you, Jamie. 
Judy Rommelhart is more than the person that put the first campaign together that turned the theater into something that people went, what? Why do we want to save the Michigan Theater? The, we, the Power Center is brand new. Why would we want a broken down old theater into something that people went, oh, I get it now. And besides her great work as a fundraiser, as a board chair, as a stellar community person, she's also my adopted mom. <laughs> in more ways than I can tell. So thank you, Judy. You're the best song I could ever ask for. <laughs> no, I've had two other really good ones. Yes, and Judy has two other really good sons <laughs> that's actually related to her. <laughs> the uh, uh, Lou Belcher um, was that city official, that elected official, who had a vision and was willing to put his political uh, capital down in a time that it was risky to do that, uh, and he made, made things happen. Uh, otherwise, we couldn't have gotten here. Um, and then Henry Aldridge, the other side of the volunteer loop that Jamie has, um, represents a whole bunch of people, dozens and dozens of people who invested years uh, and, 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 and thousands of hours uh, putting their heart and soul into this place. But Henry was clever enough to know how to wave the flag to get the mayor's attention, to engage larger parts of the community, and set a precedent for all of the community leaders to, to participate. And, and that's what it takes to make a project like this. <laughs> Besides Deb, um, the other folks that deserve uh, immense amount of credit, and if I don't say this, Henry will, is all of the staff that come in here every day and have for years and years and years. If you are or were a staff member of the Michigan Theater, please stand up. Yeah. Shelley McMillan, the first person I hired at the Michigan Theater, we were reminiscing about the fact that uh, there were, there were times in that early days where we'd say, you know what, your paycheck, which is issued on Friday, if you could cash that on Monday, we'll actually have money in the bank. Fortunately, it's not like that anymore, but uh, uh, we're, we're very grateful to those folks. And then the other folks uh, that if we could have stand up are those folks that are or were members of the Michigan Theater Board. Please stand up. So uh, this went on longer than, than we thought it would, but I think it's okay. These folks are, are, uh, are, are very special people. Michael Jewett, thank you. My pleasure. My, this, is a, this is a treat. Please tune in every day to listen to Michael on WEMU. Can I say one thing? Uh, Should we let Judy say five. one thing? <laughs> I, actually, I'm going to say two things. Um, Russ is our backbone. And he has been for ever since he walked in the door. He was like a little puppy. I swear to God, he was just, <laughs> what do I do now? What do I do now? And he has grown up. I, I used to beg him to leave Ann Arbor so he could run the biggest theater complex in the world. But he said, no, I love it here. This is my home. And I love the Michigan Theater. And thank you, Russ, so much for being so steadfast. <laughs> and the other thing I would like to say, my sweet husband sitting in the front row, well, sort of the front row, uh, Don and I were married in this theater outside in the lobby uh, 25 years ago yesterday. And he's the best thing in my life. <laughs> I love you.
Well, thank you all. Again, thank you, Michael. And, and never, never, if, any, if Michael and I hear of any bad talking about any river rats, <laughs> we will come to your house. We're sure that also uh, graduates of the more recent Skyline High and Ann Arbor High and now later Pioneer and Community High are also big supporters of the theater. We want to make sure <laughs> everybody's covered. But yeah, we do share a certain... St. Thomas. Well, uh, yeah, St. Oh, Gabriel, Rudolf St. Steiner. Yeah, it, it all works. It all, it works. all works. It's a whole community. All right, so uh, Lou's, Lou wants to say something too. Well, I wanted to thank the community. I've never seen a community come together. When I put the bond issue, twisting a few arms on city council to do it, the community passed that bond issue by the biggest margin of any bond issue in the history of Ann Arbor, and that, that is including today. I think it passed almost 86 to 90 percent. I had the day after we bought the theater, which I owned for a week. I did not want the theater for a week. I had to sign up papers to buy it, and I didn't have city council's approval. I went home and said, people, we may have to move uh, down to the theater and sell the house because, <laughs> but, but Del Dunbar, who has been mentioned before and I couldn't let this go, I called Margaret uh, Towsley, great family, I mean, really, do it. they did everything for the community. I said, Margaret, I need $50,000 tomorrow to buy the organ, the projectors, and the seats. I later learned that you had a party come down and take the toilets and the sinks and everything else out before they got it. Is that correct? And so Del Dunbar, their auditor and the city auditor at the same time, came up to me the next morning and we we're gonna close on this deal and handed me a check for $50,000 but it was made out to me. And I said, uh, do you know what the income tax is on this, Dell? I said, I need a check made out to the city of Ann Arbor. And he said, look, I brought it over here. That's your problem. <laughs> so I want to thank Dell Dunbar. I said, <clears throat> I called Margaret and said, Margaret, could we have another check? And could you have it delivered by somebody else? <laughs> <laughs> I have one more little tidbit. The day after we bought the theater, did anybody remember Clan Crawford? Oh, yeah. He was a ornery little son of a, well, anyway. <laughs> he, he was on my butt all four terms I was mayor. He didn't do this right, he didn't do that right. Anything. But anyway, the day after we bought the theater, he came over to my office, which was right across the street from my corporation I owned. And he said, you're in more goddamn trouble than you ever thought you were in. Here's $15,000 worth of GM stock I'll never use. Get the goddamn, you're going to use it more than I am. I said, Thanks. Uh, thank you, Clan. <laughs> community, community, community. Great city. Wouldn't want to. All right, we're going we're gonna to clear the stage and get the movie going. We have a really wonderful documentary about movie palaces. Uh, let's give these fine folks a hand. They're going to exit stage left. And we'll get going in just a moment.